As you said, my name's Pat Dudgeon. I live and work in beautiful Noongar, Wajak Noongar Buja, that's in Perth in Western Australia, but my people are, from, are Bardi people. For, so I've got two um, lines, Bardi and Gidja from the Kimberley. So that's my cultural background. I actually um, was born and grew up in Darwin, however, because there's a bit of a beat from Darwin to Broome. And, um, and so um, I was born and grew up there. I actually left Darwin in my early 20s because I wanted to study psychology and there were no universities in Darwin at the time. So hence I, I made a decision to come to Perth, which was quite a challenge. Um, but I came to Perth and started studying psych back back then. That was the early 18, um, 18. That was the <laughs> early 1980s. So um, it was, um, you know, I, I was quite, I was quite considerably young too. At the time I didn't feel young, but, um, mm -hmm. um, and I got through it. I mean, it was really hard yakka because I'd left school when I was 15. And so, um you know, I was always interested in scholarly activities, though. So I'd done some um, programs at the local community college and made the big jump and just, and got an, uh, uh, got a mature age entry into um, uh, the. Uh, it was called the Western Australian Institute of Technology at the time. It later became Curtin, and um, I studied psychology. I actually did anthropology as my minor, mm, and so I did I. Say, I loved anthropology much more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, psychology was so ethnocentric um, and um, anthropology, at least you had that opportunity to step into, you know, the, the shoes of another culture. Um, and I did feel like changing um, courses partway through, but I thought, no, the reason I kept on going is because I'd done a lot of swapping and changing throughout my life. And I thought, no, I can't do that now. I've got to stay with this. Yeah. So that's why I continued with psychology. Um, and I graduated. I didn't know that I was. Uh, I used to hang about at the uh, Indigenous Studies program at um, at Curtin, and it saved my life. I don't think I could have continued if it wasn't there. So, um, my hat is always off um, to the big value and importance of the Indigenous support programs. They just kept me in there. I would have left, I think, immediately. But um, it was there that I found um, good Indigenous colleagues and friends. Um, um, great support. Um, we did a lot of activities. I probably was closer to the other Indigenous um, uh, students um, than I was to uh, psych students. Later on, I developed some uh, strong relationships, but not initially. Um, so um, anyone who's considering studying whatever, go to your Indigenous program. They will support you and give you the sanctuary that you sometimes require. I thought I could... By doing psychology, I'd help people. So that's yeah. why I, I wanted to do psychology. I felt I could be helpful. And then it was just um, I probably would have changed. I mean, Anthrop, I didn't have any um, experience with sociology, but I loved anthropology for some mm -hmm. reason. I just totally loved it. And yeah. all my marks reflected that. I had the high marks in Anthrop and the, <laughs> the lowest mark I ever got was in statistics and whatnot. Um <laughs> So, but you have to just grit your teeth and go through it. There were yeah. some units I did that I absolutely loathed. Um, but if you're in a program, you just, you know, do do enough to pass or get the required grade you need and just grit your teeth. Yeah. So, um, so it is a hard, you know, I speak now having done it all, um, uh, but, at the time, it was like a, I, it was insurmountable. It was like this a hu huge task, and I didn't know as much as I would have liked. I think I, I, um, I wish I had done a bridging course. Um, mm. uh, yeah, so I think if you're a student, uh, Indigenous or non-Indigenous, and there's an opportunity to do a bridging course, do take it. Mm. Give you if it's a good bridging course, it'll give you mastery over writing. Um, so it was hit and miss and learning how to write an essay when I I did my work, but it'll give you those basic academic skills and personal skills too, knowing what your program is, you know, and putting that together, navigating mm -hmm. 
university system. So so do um, avail yourself of those supports if they're there and the networking, that that's important. You need to build um, good networks with your fellow students. Um, yeah. because- that helps you. you. You get an opportunity to s- discuss issues, f- you know, social opportunities, obviously, and you get personal support from other students as well. I think that uh, psychology itself has had this ongoing identity crisis as a as a discipline, you know, trying to so desperately hard to be recognised as a scientific discipline um, that it lost the best of its uh, itself in that, you know, and that is this um, social and cultural responsiveness, the critical thinking, and yeah. and so on. So I think that um, when we were studying, certainly it was a time when when psychology, I hope it's relaxed since then. Where I'm situated, which I'll talk about a bit more later, um, it certainly is a different landscape. Mm. But I I know at that time, you know, if you said anything different and no one ever questioned that the values that was driving um, that were driving psychology were western you know and very limited um you know it was like it's probably reflective of what was happening in in society where where um you know um everything normal and standard which were white was seen unspoken and uh you know uncritically taken as that was the reality and anything that Mm. didn't match it was was um uh, defective in some way so um so i think psychology was reflecting a certain um you know thinking that was prevalent in our broader society at the time as well I I do remember doing some radical research, though, as a student. I worked closely with um, Dr. Judith Kearns, and she was, she'd actually probably, um, uh, I, she'd probably, or how do I say, I'm going to just come out with it. She probably ruined her career. Um, I think it it was hard being a a, a female um, academic back in those days. Yeah. Taking um taking on a particular topic that was very controversial, um so her her um thinking at the time was that Aboriginal people had different cognitive um skills and strengths to other um populations, mm. um, and um she did a, a series she t- well, she was trying to develop she figured out that visual spatial. Um, memory was a, an Indigenous stra- cognitive strength, mm. and she. She was figuring out tests that would measure that. And um, when she tested um, Aboriginal, and it was the way she did the test too, she did it very carefully, casually. What I think, you know, they weren't timed as rigor- rigorously so people mm. could take their time. But um, when she um, uh, 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 applied these visual spatial memory tests to Indigenous children, they scored high, highly, um, particularly mm. lower in traditional um, uh, uh, living context. Even urban Aboriginal, Aboriginal children scored higher and closer to the um, Aboriginal um, group than they did to the non-Indigenous. Non-Indigenous children scored poorly. So um, mm. so that was interesting. And I, I did a bit of work with her about that. It wasn't very popular. Um, I think that, you know, white Australia wasn't prepared to hear that, you know, Aboriginal people were coming to the table with any strengths. Um, at the same time, in 1995, we had the Ways Forwards um, report come out um, by um, uh, Beverly Raphael and Pat Swan. So that that came out, and we were part of that. We were part of those consultations. Okay. We were part of the first ever national Aboriginal mental health conference that was um, driven by Aboriginal people, um, and um, and the Ways Forward report came out, which was a significant um, uh, text for us um, working in the area. Area. And um, and I think we've that it's still we still honour it in different ways today. You know that still has that's had a big enormous legacy. Um, so so it was probably um the mid late nineteen nineties that the big changes happened or started happening. I mean they're not immediately. Obviously they mm. take time to spread in their influence and whatnot. So we were very passionate about it, and, and I used to do a lot of work with an old mentor, Carrie Pickett, mm-hmm. and, um, 
We used to go to the APS conferences. We were very much on the fringe, though, having said that. Um, and we'd try to get gather together um, Indigenous students and Indigenous psychologists. Um, so we were trying to bring us together um, and to provide that support network, if you like, um, for everyone at the time. Um, and um, But mainstream psychology didn't recognise us at all. If you're going to start some something, I'd say with your group, don't expect everyone to think the same. Don't ever be a cult yeah. leader. Um, <laughs> encourage differences of opinion, but obviously the the big picture stuff is um, what will um, draw you together. And um, have meetings, you know, offer. Uh, for nowadays I'd be saying set up a chat group on social media. Make mm. sure you attend the mainstream conferences, but build in time that your group meets and have yeah. conversations as well. Write papers together um, and, um, yeah, uh, um, just make sure that you do do some actions that pull your group together and you find like-minded people. Um, so I don't, yeah, I don't think it's that um, complicated. Mm. Yeah, it's, it can be done. But a bunch of people went out to Maralinga were non-Indigenous within the APS and and with Indigenous psychologists. With and, Indigenous sites. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't there because there was there was a plane strike on at the time. Right. Yeah. So the pilots had gone on strike, so I wasn't able to go. But Tracy Bunder went. Okay. Yeah. So she went on our behalf. Myself and Darlene Oxenham originally were going to go, and we'd just written a paper. One of the probably the first papers on Indigenous well-being, if you like, mm -hmm. and talking about um, things like, you know, is there a concept of kindredness between Aboriginal people? So we were having a having a little play at um, writing a paper on, on the topic, and I think that was one of the, the uh, small keynotes as well, which Tracy delivered on our behalf. Um, but we did miss Maralinga, but I think that was important because it took psychologists <clears throat> out of the conference and into the community, mm -hmm. and that became the, um, I think that was, I believe that the um, interest group, Aboriginal people, Aboriginal issues and psychology, um, uh, they, they're the ones that organised that. Um, and th that continued, you know, when there was an APS conference Often there'd be a visit to the community um, as a part of that for the community site. So I know when I think one of the conferences was in Cairns and we went to visit Yarraba community as part of the activities there. But the one to Maralinga was very um, profound. Um, it was it was being there in you know, recognising a, a, a silent history that had happened where, you know, Aboriginal lands were used for nuclear testing and um it wasn't made public um and and that was very important so i think um a lot of the principles of community psychology we were naturally adopting you know about being politic um or being political um of um you know the values empowering communities so it was very much local um we'd in, um uh collaborate with the local community for our community visits and whatnot so um yeah the Maralinga, i would see that as a um uh, an important milestone or mile, um, what do you call them, marker in in the mm -hmm. history. You mentioned, though, the Aboriginal Peoples and Aboriginal Issues Interest Group. Do you know when that formed? Were you part of that? Yeah, I was the first Aboriginal um, convener. Mm -hmm. Aunt Vino actually had um, uh, run it before I had. Yeah. And um, they were desperately looking around saying, are there any Indigenous psychologists? And they found me, so I became the conv uh, convener for that. And and it's still running now. At the moment, um, Yvonne Clark and Kelly Ryan are the co-conveners. Um, so the interest uh, group is still in existence yeah. uh, and still doing um, work just, you know, um, uh, despite there being other activities that have happened too. Um, but um, that was an important um, uh, point um, and, and a catalyst for some of the changes that were happening. I think that's when we published our first book. It was around the year 2000. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and and um, I published um, Working with Indigenous Australians, uh, mm-hmm. uh, a handbook for psychologists, and um, we actually set the mould. Um, it was part of my sabbatical activities, I think, at the time, and everyone got sick of me talking about this great book I was doing um, and um, because it seemed to go on forever. But um, the editors of it was myself, Darren Garvey and Harry Pickett, and um, just working on it, trying to figure out what needed to go in there. But we set the mould for other texts that came afterwards. Um, It was a great book and it was the first time because we'd been going to many conferences doing cultural awareness and whatnot. So the book was an opportunity to put all that into one place and it was very much about um, it had different chapters and it was brilliant. And because it was a government publication, it was free. So Mm. that was our first working together book. Mm. So that went out everywhere. Mm. Um, I think, and the timing was right as well. I I do believe that, you know, maybe you've got an initiative, but you might have the the wrong time and the wrong place. Yeah. The timing was right for this book. Within a few months, over 50,000 copies were sent out. That's awesome. Yeah, that just hit out there. And then we negotiated with the um, government um, to have an, uh, a, a second edition, and um, and I think the first one was in 2010 and the second one was in 2014. Yeah. So we, I'd taken that over um, by that stage, and so it was there was myself, Helen Milroy, Ros Walker. Um, we were the three editors for that next mm. Um, and we put social and emotional well-being in it. So there were some new chapters. Uh, the other chapters had been updated, and that also has had a similar success. By then we had had some um, uh, uh, special editions of Australian Psychologist, yeah. um, which um, I was um, the first special edition. I shared that with a non-Indigenous colleague. The second one, I was the editor. So there was, you know, allies helping and then a, a, a handover, as it should yeah. be. Um, and right now I've actually done the handover to a young Indigenous um, Nyungar psychologist and they're doing a special collection um, uh, for Australian, or uh, the online version um, mm. Australian psychologists, so and that'll be on Indigenous knowledges. So, Great. so um, and I'm seeing all these wonderful uh, emerging Indigenous sites, and you know they're all f- wonderful and fabulous. Yeah. Um, in 2008, though, IEPA was launched. That's the Australian Indigenous Psychologists Association. Yeah. So we'd come together for um to do a project for the APS. And in the process of us coming together, we established ourselves as a group. And that still um, is ongoing. Um, it's a voluntary organisation, but um, it, it it punches way above its weight. Um, but, we, you know, we here and there we've tried to seek money, but we haven't been successful. But regardless, <clears throat> psychology now, Indigenous psychology and psychology has become a big issue. Um, so um, we need to try and get funding again. And I, I'd like to see more support going out to members and, and young Indigenous sites who are studying. So, um, but well, that's, that's um, you know, uh, 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 survived since 2008. So that will continue to to go on, the Australian Indigenous Psychologists Association. Um, I was um, one of the founders and um, uh, the first um, chair of that organisation. The chair now is Vanessa Adwidge, and we've we've had all sorts of lovely um, people come and serve on the board and whatnot.